Good afternoon, everyone. And we have an interesting session on collection of ocular samples in various patients. And this is something we as a clinician are often faced with when especially there is a diagnostic dilemma. And uh, with me in this instruction course, uh, I have uh, Dr. Lakshmi Mahesh, apparently she and Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam. They were not able to come from Bangalore, uh, but they have sent their pre-recorded talk. So we'll be having two talks uh, which are pre-recorded. And I'm also accompanied by Dr. Jyotirmay Biswas. Sir is um, uh, going to be speaking on handling and proceeding the vital samples. We have Dr. Vishali Gupta. She will be speaking on things to remember in a chorioretinal biopsy, the indications and technique. I also have with me Dr. Sangeet Mittal. And uh, he will be speaking to us on needling, uh, sorry, ocular sampling in a case of endophthalmitis. So without any wastage of time, let's go ahead with the first talk. Is that what you can do full screen? Yes, I can. And it will be nice if we can have an interactive session. So though we have very uh, few participants here. Okay. Lakshmi Mahesh from Bangalore. I'll be covering the topic on eyelid and orbital biopsies in this course. I thank Dr. Manisha and AIOS for the opportunity. Before embarking on eyelid biopsies or surgery, it's very important to know the anatomy well. You should realize that just below the skin is the orbicularis muscle and the eyelid skin is very thin. At the same time, it's also very forgiving. And so it's better not to have a bad scar and we should know where exactly we have to make the incisions to get the right amount of tissue. The characteristics of lid malignancy are very many. There could be ulceration, lack of tenderness, induration, irregularity of the lesion and the lid margin, with loss of lid margin and palpable conjunctival architecture, dilated blood vessels that is telangiectasia, pearly borders as in basal cell carcinoma, etc. A careful evaluation of the palpable conjunctiva under a slit lamp, both with oblique torch and a slit lamp is very essential. We could pick up foreign bodies, allergic papillae, we could pick up scars of previous surgeries. And in this patient who came with a presentation of ptosis and a little bit of conjunctivitis had a diffuse sebaceous gland carcinoma involving the upper lid on eversion. Calaison, I generally like to be conservative and like to treat the cause. But in certain cases, when there are multiple recurring and a bother to the patient, an upcoming function or wedding or change of job or to go, or to go out of the country, then so we would have to do an IND. But in elderly people, or even when the lesion looks suspicious, it's always good to take the contents of the IND for biopsy and also excise a thin lip of the wound which you make internally because here you know we don't suture and send that also for biopsy mainly to rule out a early sebaceous gland carcinoma so that we don't land up like in this case where he had four sebaceous gland uh, four Calaison INDs and later landed up with this large lesion, inflamed lesion for the fifth time which was already involving half the orbit. He had to have an exenteration. This was about 15-20 years back and he was very unhappy after that. He had severe uncontrolled diabetes and finally succumbed to Metastasis, uh, metastasis to the lung. So sometimes before the lesion can present itself to a substantial size, some amount of metast metastasis would have already occurred. Now this gentleman had an AML and this needed only an incisional biopsy followed by treatment for the leukemia. Here again, this is lady came for a ptosis correction, but on eversion, we found lymphoma there, 
in the palpebral conjunctiva which had to be excised and she underwent further chemotherapy. Excuse me. In certain lesions as warts, a snip biopsy would be sufficient. A gentle cautery at the base is very important. The lesion may look not look not so sinister, look very warty and dry, but the base can be very vascular. So we have to keep in mind about that. Intradermal nevus, junctional nevus at the lid margin, a shave biopsy would suffice. It's better not to remove the entire wedge excision and entire lid there and try to anastomose. But if you think that's going to leave behind a coloboma, which is significant and cosmetically it will be a blemish, then we would have to do wedge excision followed by anastomosis. In suspicious cases, the wedge excision can be done under frozen section control to see if the margins are free before you um, embark on uh, suturing that is reconstruction and this was a case of melanoma an extensive melanoma and a few years and he was kept under close observation and follow-up this was a tiny recurrence he developed for this I did a shave biopsy and this is how it was and uh, he also needed uh, topical mitomycin this was again about 14 15 years back and he did very well with topical uh, uh, treatment as well for the pigment dusting excision biopsy is needed in certain cases because simply if you just waste time and doing an incisional biopsy if it's a very tiny lesion then it may not be conclusive so where you know for sure that the lesion has to go especially if it is disturbing the patient cosmetically as well it's better to remove the entire lesion that is what we call as excision biopsy xanthelasma again more than chemical peels are preferred to excise and carefully cauterize because these can be again very vascular and and suture the wound. Wedge excision, which reconstruction, as I was talking about, is for again suspicious lesions. You could do a frozen section in select cases, and this turned out to be a basal cell carcinoma. Here again, these lesions needed a wedge excision with reconstruction. Vascular lesions, we have to be beware. They may not look so vascular when we see, but as I told you, even dry lesions and those which look very warty can be very vascular at the base. And the vascular lesions per se can be even more vascular. You could try injection of tricot or sclerosing agents before you can, and shrink the size of the lesion before you embark on excision, because, especially in young patients because they can lose a lot of skin tissue there, uh, lid tissue there. So you have to be careful and you must be prepared for the bleeding and to manage the same. This was a case of amyloidosis. Here he needed a combination of excision, shave biopsy and um, uh, he also needed some cryo to the base of the lesion. Frozen section, as I mentioned earlier, is a very important aspect of managing eyelid malignancies. You have to mark, you have to give a 3 to 5 millimeter clearance all around. This was a basal cell carcinoma. And basal cell carcinoma, typically, they, we call them rodent ulcer because we know that they burrow deep inside. So they may look very small on the outside, but as we start excising, it goes in pretty deep. And here I marked all the sites carefully and sent it for the uh, frozen section where I was no told that the inferior margin was still involved. So further excision of the lid, inferior margin was also done before a, a reconstruction of this difficult case. This was a median forehead flap used for reconstruction. Sometimes superficial biopsy, as I said earlier, may not be enough. You may just get some amount of skin and inflamed tissue. You have to go deep in them. And this is very important when you are suspecting early sebaceous gland carcinomas especially. And this was another unfortunate case where elsewhere he had undergone a superficial biopsy. So though he was getting, and it was said there was no malignancy, then he was, there was such a massive lesion which had recurred. But since he was already diagnosed to have no malignancy, he slept over it. But by the time he came, this was a large extensive lesion again involving more than half the orbit. He refused excentration, so new adjuvant chemotherapy was given. But the cornea went for a toss because of so much of treatment and had to be carefully bandaged. And in between, he needed bouts of uh, bandage contact lens as well. A squamous cell carcinoma, again, we should, we should do a precise, complete cut. And this was again a re recurrence where 
it was extending a bit deep but he didn't want uh, excentration so in this case brachytherapy was done and uh, though it was not at all cosmetically accepted this was this was what the patient wanted he didn't want excentration or removal of the eye and uh, he he did well at least from the tumor part of it now some patients can have multiple lesions in the skin nasal area you have to be very careful and carefully remove them and for this uh, for the eyelid tumors this is again a frozen section excision under frozen section control and a hughes modified hughes flap was done to reconstruct sometimes if the skin of the adjacent eyelid is not uh, adjacent skin is not enough you will have to do a full thickness skin graft you can do one flap you can do you can take a flap you can have a graft you can't have two grafts one over the other and it's better to avoid that so you should you should either have a flap and a graft combination for reconstruction sometimes you have to aspirate the contents of the orbit especially if it is pus or some other uh, suspicious tissue and send the contents for uh, histopathological and microbiological ev evaluation so you usually take the biopsy in a syringe and this was a orbital biopsy of a lymphangioma again it's try it's best to remove the complete lesion if it's a large chocolate cyst you can aspirate this contents and send it for cytospin analysis and the tumor per se or the cyst wall can be separately excised and sent for histopathological e evaluation in very large bulky tumors which cause mechanical obstruction to vision it's good to debulk the lesion as much as possible this was a high grade malignant lymphoma so excision by see that is as much as possible debulking was also done and then you after the confirmation of the diagnosis staging is done with a pet scan for further treatment these days we don't subject lymphoma patients to radiation they do very well with chemotherapy this is an orbital pleomorphic orbit adenoma of the lacrimal gland which was completely excised in toto and it's important to remove the capsule in lacrimal gland lesions and in lacrimal gland lesions it's also better to improve and um, remove the normal gland when you are a uh, little suspicious because you don't want to leave behind the gland recurrences can be malignant even if it's a pleomorphic adenoma and all the more if it is an adenoid cystic carcinoma and very many a time along with the biopsy it's good to remove as much of the tumor as possible de bulk because you can decrease the tumor load for further treatment so the previous slide was a typical lateral orbitotomy uh, and for uh, for a uh, orbital malignancy and this is how you like at the end of the day most of the cases to be this was a typical basal cell carcinoma excision under frozen section with a full thickness skin graft supraclavicular skin graft and he had very good cosmesis so thank you very much i hope i've just been able to give you a gist as to how we should be equipped in handling eyelid and orbital tumors for biopsy thank you very much once again <clears throat>
So we wouldn't have uh, many of the corneal blind. Perhaps 50% of corneal blind are due to uh, active keratitis or the scars that happen due to active keratitis or even the bad complications. So that's the reason why we need to be very well aware of the spectrum of organisms that we have, which includes bacteria as well as fungi. But if you notice, it's kind of a half and half. So you, we cannot just go with empirical therapy. We need to know what exactly the patient has. It's not enough to just have a clinical diagnosis without uh, sampling the cases of infective keratitis. For example, these are very classic textbook-like pictures for each of these entities that I've put up. So what is the need for the, uh, inf scraping? We have to establish the microbial diagnosis, whether it's bacterial, whether it's gram-positive or negative, then what is the nature of the organism, low or high virulence, and then have culture and antibiotic sensitivity for these cases. Uh, we found out the hard way that just having fungal-like filaments, which look high-line, is not fungal infection only, it's pythium, and that's how we learned. And they behave so differently, and they can just devastate the eye. And of course, uh, luck luckily, parasitic is rare, but, but imagine that you don't detect these, and the patient gets, keeps getting treated for some other cause, because it looks like fungal, for example, in acanthamoeba, and the patient doesn't get better. So, and we have a sort of a small subset of mixed infections. So you're treating for one organism, but there's another organism as well. So that's all the reasons why we need to have proper microbiological evaluation. So is it enough to just have clinical diagnosis? Aren't we right most of the times? The answer is no. Even in the hands of experts, or the, when, when cornea specialists were sampled, so the results showed that the value of clinical diagnosis was 65%, which is okay, but that means we're losing out on 35% of patients. And even in those 65%, we don't know if the organism is sensitive to the antibiotics that we're using, so we could be on the long, wrong track, actually. So, so that's the reason why, in, in except for the very simple peripheral corneal infection, all other infections of the cornea should definitely undergo microbiology. And uh, when to scrape would be at first presentation, uh, however, we can have very small ulcers, uh, less than two millimeters, or it's already healing by the time the patients come to you, not in the center. So those cases we need not scrape. What do we need? Uh, the very basic set, which I'm sure many of you may not have done, except for one senior registr registrar that I can see, a senior resident I can see here. Nobody else would have done this for a while now. We're not touching this for a while now. but. Those of you who are in your own practice might have to do it. So you need, this is what the set entails, and it's very easy to set it up. So you need topical anesthetic, surgical blade, and this is the armamentarium that you need to take a corneal scraping. And sometimes we even have to do it under sedation or general anesthesia for children. Otherwise, you can do it at the slit lamp or make, or make the patient lie down. And if you have an operating mic microscope, just use that for scraping the eye. You can put a speculum. And make sure you don't, it doesn't get contaminated by the discharge or the debris and keep the lashes away. So this is a surgical, simple video just to demonstrate how to do it effectively at the slit lamp. Patient is anesthetized. So don't scrape from this, the thinned out area, but rather scrape from the base as well as the active edges. So first you prepare it, uh, smear it like that for gram staining and just drop it on the slide that was for KOH, which will also have calcoflow white later under the microscope mount. And various media, the first one to inoculate is the uh, blood agar, chocolate agar. Uh, chocolate agar is most important because everything literally that can grow will grow in it. And we also take a non-nutrient agar, that is to rule out acanthamoeba, although it's very rare, but if you don't sample it in non-nutrient agar, we might miss it out. So we've learned it the hard way again. So this is a basic uh, module for microbiological evaluation. The smears, as I mentioned to you, it has a 10% potassium hydroxide, gram stain, and gene stain. We don't do gene stain in all cases. Sometimes you might want to. And based on the clinical suspicion, our microbiologist will restain some of these. They'll, they decolorize the gram stain and use acid fast stain if you're suspecting acid fast organisms. In terms of culture, I just showed some of the media, but we also inoculate for fungi in potato dextrose agar or other media, and also use liquid media because you might have very tiny uh, portion of the microbe, and then that might uh, inoculate a liquid media m more easily. So this is what a simple KOH mount would look like. And in our secondary centers, we have our the, the doctors who are there, they take the scrapings and they look at it under a on a uniocular microscope, just put KOH, which will sort of dissolve the cells, uh, which are not the fungal cells, and you see mice the fungal filaments very easily uh, visible. And nowadays, we also add tripen blue exact to the stain, so it highlights against blue color. Uh, 
And this is uh, other stains that you can see. A Cathemiba cysts, if you have plenty of cysts, then you can pick up these double wall structures just under in the KOH wet mount. And uh, sometimes we can see microsporidia also, which are, which we may need a higher magnification, so which are very tiny looking oval like structures. You can pick up a few. And this will, look, will require more experience as compared to KOH, which is the easiest. So if you rule out that it's not fungus, then you at least know that it's most probably bacterial and you can start antibiotics. So the one person calcofluor white is a specialized uh, way in which you never miss, you almost 95% or even 99% of the times or our uh, microbiologists can pick it up because it just if fluoresces in there and fungus will not be missed out. Also it will highlight microsporidium. This is a previous slide where you apply a KOH and then one person calcofluor white and then you use the fluorescein microscope and it'll, everything will just light up like this. So you can't miss microsporidia using that system and acanthamoeba as well. So these, or oh, this is a yeast, sorry. It's a budding yeast that you can pick up. And finally, acanthamoeba, which are these, uh, un the same magnification. So you'll see that the cysts are much, much larger than the microsporial cysts. So this is acanthamoeba. And this is a newer entity. So you see that it looked a bit like fungus, but the major difference is that it's not having those typical, very rigid kind of septae. And you'll see these folds. They're called ribbon-like folds. And so our microbiologists noticed that this was different from the typical fungus. And we noticed that these patients were doing very, very badly. They wouldn't respond to antifungals. And they were just, we were losing their eyes. So we not, so finally we realized this is Pythium, which is not, which is a different organism altogether. Doesn't respond to antifungals. Uh, I won't go through gram stain. This is very basic, but it's a very interesting. Some of you may recall doing it, at least those who, who've done cornea training. So it's a very simple way of doing this. I'm not going through it. But the information it gives is very valuable. You can have gram-positive organisms, gram-negative ne uh, organisms. So you know which track and what set of antibiotics you have to start for these two pa groups of patients. So this is gram-positive and gram-negative bacilli. Acid fast staining is invaluable in rarer infections. So when your clinician has to provide some guidance to the microbiologist, so when you take the sample, you have to tell whether this is looking atypical or depending on sometimes the history uh, no cardiac hepatitis was associated with post LASIK infections also. So the the um, and then there are certain clinical clues like a REIT like infection in the case of no cardia. So the microbiologist is is ex is asked to do the acid fast staining, and you can pick up these very bright pink organisms sometimes even as sort of colonies on acid fast staining. And this is an actinomyces very long segmented looking filament uh, on under one percent acid fast staining. So that's pretty much what we do and the basics for infective keratitis in terms of sampling the ocular microbiology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manish. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we have to, that's why we have to inoculate. First, inoculate the media in which almost everything grows. So, and smears are most important. So initially, whatever uh, amount of material you take, so, so make sure you don't take it from the central thinned out portion, but take it from the edges of the spreading ulcer. So that's number one. And the gram and KOH is the most important. So that's the crux of it. So you make sure that you, you, know, do, you apply your material well to that. Afterwards, the media to inoculate, always select either chocolate agar or blood agar. So many people think that it's fungus, so let me do the potato dextrose agar. But you do the blood agar, chocolate agar first, and then do a liquid media. So this should be your sequence. So you're more likely to get growth in these, whether it's fungi or whichever organism, except for acanthamoeba, will grow in these uh, reagents. And then the other problem is that the microbiologists have to be clued in. If you're working in a hospital when there's general microbiology, they, for them, this is a very minuscule amount of sample. They deal, they deal with huge amount of samples, biological samples, with cc's and cc's of pus and so on, or infected material. Whereas we just give a small, minuscule of amount, so they see nothing initially. So the ocular microbiologist has to be trained to try and pick up from that specs. They will know that. Once you tell them you're looking for those specs, that's what you want. Because for them, GPCs and all are commensals. They don't know those GPCs are causing, causing the corneal infection. So you have to have a dialogue with them. So, and no growth, there are different reasons, because there may be a, a time lag from when you send the samples to when they inoculated it. So there are many of them are quite delicate in that way, the organism, and the load is very low. So you have to immediately provide it the environment it needs, the temperature and so on. So if there's a long chain in transporting them, it won't grow. 
it dies in transit. Yeah, so what we follow is that in 48 hours, we, if we get microbiology, there's nothing, and we've got negative, smear negative. In 48 hours, we have some idea about rapid growing organisms like bacteria. So if there's, everything is sterile, then we repeat the smears again. And then we look at the clinical picture. If we think it's going to be uh, acanthamoeba, then, but we do acanthamoeba in the beginning itself, begin institute setup. So uh, after 48 hours, after that, then you might go on, venture onto a biopsy. Uh, if that's the third, because it's a cornea, you can't scrape it too many times. So the third, this, the next intervention would be a corneal biopsy. Thank you very much. Any comments from you, JB sir? So, uh, good afternoon, and uh, in the coming 10 minutes, I would be speaking on diagnostic vitrectomy in uveitis. So, Dr. Somshila, we are moving from outside to in. We had Dr. Lakshmi, who told us about orbital biopsies. Then we had Dr. Somshila, who concentrated on the keratitis sampling. And uh, now I would be speaking on vitrectomy in uh, various indications for uveitis. So whenever we are doing a vitrectomy, even for a diagnostic purpose, it of course needs an informed consent and you have to explain to the patient very clearly that it is being done for a diagnostic purpose and it's not going to be having any impact on the visual recovery or any, you know, it's not being done for a therapeutic purpose. You have to, of course, follow strict aseptic precautions, adequate anesthesia is required, and of course, a teamwork is required because that sample, what you're collecting, is an important sample which is going to be ultimately helping you in the diagnosis and planning the management for the patient. So it's a very important sample, so you must have or take the sample in coordination with your lab facilities. As far as the vitreous sampling is concerned, it helps in cases of unknown etiology by identifying specific causative agents like an endophthalmitis and precise histopathological grouping of the involved entities. The recent advances in the form of MIVS, of course, has made this procedure very safe and it should be considered sooner than later. So earlier on, when we used to have a 20-gauge vitrectomy, we used to keep postponing because we felt that it had a lot of complications. But in today's time, with MIVS cutters like a 25-gauge or a 27-gauge, we, you know, intervene much earlier. As far as the indications of a diagnostic vitrectomy in uveitis is concerned, you can have both infectious and non-infectious etiologies. Infectious, of course, the most important being endophthalmitis because of various organisms. We can also have, uh, you know, indications like any viral retinitis where you are a little lost with the diagnosis. As far as non-infectious is concerned, we can have intraocular lymphoma. Again, that is a great mimicker, and we are often, you know, not able to diagnose, and sometimes we have to plunge to doing a diagnostic vitrectomy. Any kind of non-infectious uveitis, and of course, very important, again, is the masquerades. So this is, or any patient who is showing an atypical response to the clinical diagnosis that you've made and the management that you are doing, and if the patient is not showing the response that you were expecting, then probably it's time to intervene and do a interventional diagnostic procedure. As far as the contraindications are concerned, well, if you can make the diagnosis with a non-invasive investigation, obviously you are going to prefer that to, you know, doing any surgical intervention. Friable tumors, again, it may not be very useful and unlikely to alter the management. So whatever management, if you decide that I'm going to be treating this patient with steroids, the patient is showing a response, then it's no point, you know, disturbing the management because in any case, you're not going to be altering your management. Now, this is a short video. <laughs> 
so here we have the cutter, we have the aspiration tubing and we have the cutter tubing. So we basically disconnect from uh, in between where you have the aspiration tubing and we connect this to a 2cc syringe. And uh, this is going to be basically that we are going to be uh, wanting to collect an undiluted sample. That's okay. So this is basically when we have not started the infusion cannula and we are just wanting to collect an undiluted vitreous sample, you're going to be connecting your vitrectomy cutter and you're going to be asking your assistant to take the aspirate in the that we are wanting to collect more and more sample and sometimes the patient's eye may start developing hypotony. So it's a good idea rather than connecting it to the infusion fluid, you can connect it to an air infusion. And the moment you start having a hypotony, you can start your air infusion. This is going to help in avoiding the hypotony and it is going to avoid the dilution of the sample. Now, once you've got the sample in the syringe, it's a good idea to cover it up with a needle and rotate this needle so that there's no contamination and cover it up with a sterile cap. We take out all kind of air bubbles that are going to be there in the sample. So either you pack it in a, a sterile packing and this is well labeled with patient details and sent to the laboratory for further investigations. The other option is that you are going to plate the sample in the operation theater itself. So you make a preparation, you take a separate table, you are going to put all the medias over it, and you're going to put a small amount of the vitreous sample that you have collected in the various medias. And then these are going to be then transported to your lab facilities. The precaution that has to be taken, of course, is that there is no element of contamination in your collection and transfer of these samples to the lab. So what we often do is that we inform the lab that we are now taking up this case for the sampling, and uh, within half an hour, you are going to have the samples ready and sent to your lab. So please be ready, because sometimes they've gone for lunch or they're not aware, then the, the sample keeps lying there and there's a potential risk of contamination, so you possibly don't want that. It's a good idea also to plate two glass slides. And this again is going to be extremely useful while collecting the samples. Now as far as certain special tips for vitreous sampling is concerned, I already told you it's a good idea to connect it to an air infusion rather than a fluid infusion because this avoids the dilution and avoids hypotony. Now coming to intraocular lymphoma, we have certain special things which we have to keep in mind. One is that we have to stop the oral steroids about two weeks prior to sampling. So we all know that the intraocular lymphomas, they respond to steroids and your yield is going to be much less. So if the patient you are suspecting an intraocular lymphoma, it's a good idea to stop the steroids at least two weeks prior to you collecting the sample. The lab is very much uh, informed well in advance because these cells are uh, very much, you know, they die very fast. So you have to inform your lab much in advance that you'll be sending this sample. The cut rate again is kept very low, something like a 600 cuts per minute. And this is because the cells are again very fragile and you don't want those cells to, you know, get uh, denatured with your cutter. All the vitreous sample with the fluid in the cassette again is collected. We had a nice presentation yesterday by Dr. Mohit Dogra, where he had actually used a soft tip cannula, uh, something like a snake uh, flute, where he had collected the sample from the subretinal space over the lesion where he was suspecting an intraocular lymphoma. So that is another technique, but that is going to be only valid for those lesions which are away from the macular area and not involving the macular area. And of course, I mentioned in other situations, it's going to be a good idea to do the plating in the operation theater. Now, just a small case example. This is an 18-year-old boy from Bihar, a gradual painless diminution of vision in the left eye for last six months with no syst uh, significant systemic or contact history, very low socioeconomic status. The patient apparently presented with this large yellowish subretinal abscess looking kind of lesion in the macular area. You do see uh, subretinal fluid involving the macular area which has detached the macula. 
And on doing a fundus loci in angiography, we do find an element of a hot disk, and some kind of a mottled hyperfluorescence is what we had seen on fundus fluorescein in angiography. On a B scan, there was just a circumscribed uh, lesion which was of a significant size over the posterior pole, which had a high surface reflectivity and a homogeneous low to moderate internal reflectivity with minimal SRF. So the provisional diagnosis seen to the profile of the patient we made was of a subretinal abscess, secondary to tuberculosis, which is very common in the area where I practice, and other chronic infections have caused were fungal. And the last thing which we had kept in the differential diagnosis was a lymph lymphoproliferative disorder being a child. Now, this is the left eye fundus. You again find this, um, this, what, this is what I had shown, a large lesion, uh, very much looking like an abscess. So we were quite lost on the diagnosis of this particular patient, so we went ahead and did a vitreous biopsy. And uh, we just collected an undiluted sample going very close to the lesion. I did not have the heart to collect the sample from the subretinal space because he was a young child. So I just restricted myself to collecting an undiluted vitreous sample going as close as possible over the lesion. And the vitreous biopsy, of course, it uh, showed uh, growth on the culture plate. And that was uh, these funny, creamy uh, looking lesions. And we had, uh, on the staining, we had a few gram-positive filamentous bacilli. So this was detected as a no-cardia species, which probably we would have never thought of if we had not done the vitreous biopsy and sent it for a culture. Uh, the acid-fast staining, of course, was negative. And the treatment was accordingly modified. The patient was sent for an MRI brain to rule out intracranial nocardiosis. And the patient was started on sulfamethoxazole and trimethopim along with oral steroids. And you find that the patient responded very well to the treatment and improved a vision with complete resolution of the subretinal fluid and the regression of the lesion. So this is another patient of a 14-year-old female patient presenting to our hospital with diminution of vision in the left eye for the last six months. There was no relevant systemic history. The anterior segment examination, the right eye vision was 612. The left eye was finger counting at three meters. There were pigments all over the anterior lens capsule. And this is how uh, the right eye fundus looked. You had a hyperemic disc, very hazy media with the details of the fundus barely visible. An intense vitritis was present, and this is how the left eye appeared. Again, a very hyperemic swollen disc. You had these yellowish lesions underneath the blood vessels with extensive vitritis. And uh, so this is how the, both the eyes, uh, the fundus, they appeared. Now, in this particular patient, uh, we had a role where it was diagnostic as well as therapeutic both. So we did go ahead and do a vitrectomy in both the eyes. Apparently, the visual recovery in the right eye was very good. It uh, came back to 6, 9. And in the left eye, this young child continued to have a poor vision of 4 by 60. Now, the sample which was collected, uh, the vitreous sample was sent for PCR, and it came out to be positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. And subsequently, this patient was detected with miliary tuberculosis, which was multidrug resistant. So apparently, we were able to put this patient on the right track of management just because we had collected the sample. It was not only subjected to PCR, but also to gene expert PCR, which detected that the patient was having indeed a multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So I just take this opportunity also to invite you, all of you to our forthcoming annual UVIT Society of India conference, which is going to be a physical conference at Hyderabad on 14th, 15th, and 16th of October. So kindly register, because the early bird registr uh, registration is already open. And also to VRSI, which is going to be at Nagpur from 2nd to 4th of December. We do have a stall in the trade area where you can do an early bird registration. So thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, you are asking. So if I get your question right, uh, what you are saying is that when do we go ahead for a vitrectomy and when do we take a vitreous sample? Yeah, yeah, right? definitely. So in today's time where we are having MIBS, once we go inside, like we are not really taking an aspirate of the vitreous because that is causing an unnecessary traction. 
what we are doing is we are using either a 25 gauge or a 27 gauge cutter and once we go inside if you are like in a case of endophthalmitis we would collect the sample and do a core vitrectomy along with it uh, pure vitreous sample collection is going to be do, done in very limited cases like i showed you if, in a patient of an intraocular lymphoma where we are just wanting to collect the sample for a diagnostic purpose but there also we are not taking an aspirate with a needle we will go ahead inside the cutter so whatever we can clear up we will try to do that i hope that answers your question thank you No, sir, I, I actually, that uh, slide apparently was missing. So the patient was put on a broad spectrum antibiotic like an ofloxacin and steroids. And the patient was from Bihar, not ready to stay back in Delhi. So he was sent back on ofloxacin and steroid. Much later, once, you know, he came back, I found that there was no response after a significant treatment with the broad spectrum antibiotic and steroid. That's the time when we plunged into it. It's only, sir, that the patient was not willing because it was a young child, so the father was not consenting for a surgical intervention. Yes, absolutely. We often do that. Ma'am, your comments? So now I will invite Dr. Vishali Gupta. She is heading the Vitro Retina and UVR Services at PGI Chandigarh. And ma'am will be speaking to us on things to remember in a chorioretinal biopsy indications and technique. Thank you very much, Manisha, and thank you everyone for, it's good to see everybody in person. So uh, what topic Manisha has given me is about uh, vitreoretinal lymphomas. Sorry, it's about chorioretinal biopsies. And the question that has been posed to me, eight seconds. Yeah. Is ka ye change kar do, ye wala. Laga do. Well, the topic that has been, give, been given to me by Manisha are the things to remember while considering chorioretinal biopsy, what are the indications and what are the techniques. So before we go on to technique, uh, a little introspection before, uh, you know, you, you might be the best surgeon in the world and before you order chorioretinal biopsies, is to think when and why. Uh, chorioretinal biopsies, honestly, you do when you are pushed to the wall because the diagnosis could not be established and the disease is very progressive and blinding despite treatment. Malignancy suspected may be, but not as a first line of intervention for malignancy suspected. And you have to be very clear, what are the indications for doing vitreous biopsy? Like somebody was asking a question, what is the indication for TAP? What is the indication for vitreous biopsy? And then what is the indication for chorioretinal biopsy? Because they are not interchangeable. So I'm, before we actually move on to choroidal biopsies, I'm going to show you three examples and three techniques of, in context of lymphoma, because that is what we all come across. Now, this is my first patient, a 60-year-old Asian male, a female, who complains of some cloudiness of the vision and decrease in both the eyes. So you look at the right eye, honestly, there is some haziness in the vitreous, but nothing you can put your finger on. And this was the left eye. We did fluorescein, and maybe we looked at it because we were honestly trying to look for it. You know, there were some changes in the RPE, which could be passed off as normal, but which probably something happening, which I could not put my finger on. Similarly, the fluorescein, few spots here, 
which I saw because honestly I was trying to see them, but one could pass them off, you know, in a busy practice. And in the later phase, you can see something is happening here. And the left eye was virtually normal. Now, this is the patient where, I don't know, sometimes your sixth sense just says, and I thought it was lymphoma. So, daughter, unfortunately, or fortunately, is a neurologist in US, so there was a lot of interference. So, uh, they consulted negative neurology, MRI, normal. They thought, how can it be lymphoma? Because, you know, mother was fine. So, I said, okay, report if there is any worsening. Three months later, she has headaches, slurring of speech, generalized varices, and now MRI shows, you know, these lesions, which was normal MRI three months ago. And uh, even at that point, the neurologist kept on saying it could be not Indian. It could be ischemic infarct, it could be tuberculoma or whatever. Anyways, neurology opinion inconclusive. Lymphoma could not be ruled out. Finally, she underwent CSF analysis, and I pushed him to do IL-610 ratios, which showed in the CSF, IL-10 was elevated, a marker towards lymphoma. Now they come to us. They are more serious this time, and uh, we have to do vitrectomy, or we have to kind of make the diagnosis for her. So what kind of diagnosis would you? There is no way you will take out that RPE or something and the biopsy. So the very simple, which Manisha has elegantly shown, so I will just add a few tips without repeating what she has done. Uh, when you are doing biopsy for lymphoma or anything, infusion, she said, put the air on. I always do that. Try to don't try to chase the aggregates because that is what our natural tendency as a vitreous surgeon are. Wherever we are seeing clumps in the vitreous, we just think that is a very precious sample. Our lymphoma cells by nature do not adhere together. So if the cells are clumping together, are they are forming balls, they are likely to be inflammatory rather than the actual malignant cells. So make sure that you have taken adequate sample from the clear vitreous as well. And if I'm doing it, I put it to, I, this is the clear vitreous and this is the, uh, you know, this is out of the contest, but I learned a hard way always, always suture these uh, uveitis patients, no ego here. So, uh, of course, we just saw a single cell to make the diagnosis and her disease probably, you know, despite all the rituximabs and everything, she's honestly not doing very well and has undergone the radiation of the brain. But the moral of the story is start with the simplest thing. And this is the story about her, how her disease progressed, responded for some time, five cycles of chemo, but over a long period she has a malignant disease. Then comes the actual topic and why would you do a biopsy? Biopsy, you have to understand you are creating a full thickness retinal as well as defect in the choroid. It's useful in the diagnosis of retina that is involving uh, hematologic malignancies, but you have to understand that when you do a biopsy, the malignancy has to involve retina. Lymphoma doesn't involve retina. So even if you have done a good biopsy, your retinal tissue is not going to show because everything is subretinal. So retinal biopsy per se will not be indicated for malignancies, which primarily do not infiltrate retina. So technique is actually very similar to internal endoresection of choroidal tumors for those of you who might be doing. It's a small gauge vitrectomy. Better to have, better, uh, I think it's always important to have chandelier because then you have your both hands free and you are not hassled in between to put MLS. You should have your forceps ready, scissors ready, and you should also be ready to enlarge the wound when you are taking out the sample and not try to squeeze it through the small because you don't want any distortion of the samples.
And you should have ability to repair retinal defect that goes without saying. And lastly, you should have Dr. Biswas sitting next to you to make the diagnosis because in multidisciplinary hospitals like us, it's very difficult to get the diagnosis out of something which might be 200 micron. They just, they just don't care. You know, or they don't have the uh, mechanism of doing it. So this, I'm going to show you the biopsy of a 62-year-old woman, recent complaint of decreased vision, treated outside with steroids. And Manisha is already told that if you are planning biopsy, uh, stop steroids. And whatever the workup had been done, but the, there was a confusion in the diagnosis. And this is what it looked like. This biopsy was done by Prithvi at Stanford, but if you ask my honest opinion and this patient was with me, I will not do biopsy. I know it's lymphoma. Why would I do chorioretinal biopsy just to prove it? But this is the OCT, and uh, OCT, this is very classical for lymphoma. The RPE elevation and subretinal deposits, and the rounded, the RPE, Elevation is rounded on OCT in lymphoma, rounded roof, we described it as, which is very important. The technique is kind of you clear the vitreous, and of course, when you are clearing the vitreous, cytology is fine, but do IL-6, IL-10 ratio. IL-10 will be elevated in lymphoma, 6 in uveitis. Do mid-88. That is not very difficult to do. But mid-88, if you find it positive, your diagnosis of lymphoma is right there and then. You ought to not really have to do it. But well, for whatever reason, if you want to do, this is the technique. And as I said, you should have chandelier in place right in the beginning. Your both hands should be free. Do a good laser around it in the beginning diathermize because you want to cut it. If you want to take a piece of choroid, just do a good diathermy and a deeper one. Then with one hand, you hold the tissue and make sure you don't hold it in the center. Just hold it from the edge because, again, you don't want to distort it. With the other hand, you can use scissor to cut out a piece of it, enlarge your incision to take it out very gently, and make sure you're not uh, you know, putting too much pressure on it, are distorting it. Just take it out gently, and of course, you need a excellent. Uh, you plate it, uh, like plate it. I mean, this is the chorea retinal biopsy, so make sure that you have put it right there in the sample. Watch under the microscope that you have got it. You don't want another one, and of course, the rest is the usual fluid gas exchange and everything. And the sample, of course, has to be uh, preserved immediately, sent to the lab, and treated with loads of respect. And here again, you can see the retina per se does not show infiltration. The whole focus is, but of course, you can make the diagnosis. And this is the post-op, primary intraocular lymphoma. And the last, which I'm going to show, because I honestly do not believe much in doing biopsies for lymphomas in this. This is done by uh, Mohit uh, in our department. So this is what Manisha was talking about. So what uh, he has done, and we are doing it many a times, uh, is that first you run the air. You take a good sample of the vitreous. And once you have taken this good sample of vitreous, undiluted, that is the most important, you see the location of these subretinal precipitates on table. And this is MIOCT. You can see there is subretinal precipitate. And even here, you can see that retina just has an exudative response. It doesn't have lymphoma cells. So why would you do? So he has seen this lesion, and then he identified another lesion which was superiorly, because to go in, you want it to be more superior and far from the posterior pole. So this is the other lesion which he has identified. You let your scan pass through this. You see what is the exact lesion, a small diathermy. 
and the soft tip extrusion which goes through this into the subretinal space. You make sure it's very long and you can actually see on OCT the tip going in the subretinal space here. You hit the cells and you can see the cells floating into the this extrusion, the soft tip extrusion. So this is the sampling of the subretinal technique which we have been following in our department now, if you want to do. But simplest is still go for a better labs like mid-88, LP265, IL6, IL10 from the vitreous because if those techniques are good, you honestly do not need biopsy or subretinal. So that is what it is. So conclusion is, well, it does have a role, but only for very select cases. So that's, thank you, Manisha, once again. Thank you, Dr. Vishali. Are there any questions for her? Uh, Ma'am, any specific precautions that you take for an undue bleeding when you're doing a chorioretinal biopsy? Yeah. Hypertensive anesthesia. Yeah. So what would be your indication for chorioretinal biopsy? My indication is when I'm not able to make the diagnosis at all. You know, and there is something which is happening, like I did one for malt lymphoma, where I was very sure something was happening and the PET scan was negative. Like I get a PET scan, I don't say a lot, but some of these patients, my first preference is to get the whole body PET scan. And if there is even a small lymph node, like yesterday I was showing a case where we picked up a small focus in the parotid. So it's very easy for somebody to approach parotate, our cervical, our abdominal, you know, they have now such good techniques. So I will be my last resort to do the biopsy. But I have done in, one in case of malt lymphoma, and one was uh, infection, which I could not figure out what it was. But that I was very disheartened because uh, my pathologist could not find anything in the retina. So I have done about four of them, four or five, not many. But, but I don't do tumors. That is, a, I just do vitreo retina. So maybe tumor people got to do it more often. But for vitreo retinal, uh, by and large, my vitreous is sufficient. Can you just repeat what did you say about malignancy retina? What I said is keep all the lymphomas when we talk of a primary vitreo retinal lymphoma, it does not infiltrate the retina. So uh, MALT is M-A-L-T is a MALT associated. It's a type of lymphoma which has a tendency to involve the choroid. So for that, we were not able to make the diagnosis. So I had taken a biopsy from the choroid. Uh, but by and large, uh, as I said, unless you are pushed to the wall, and you have a very good pathologist sitting with you, there is no point doing it, you know? Because you take it out, putting your neck at the block, because it is no longer small incision. The moment you are doing biopsy, you are extending, you are doing everything. You are making it a large incision uh, vitrectomy. So it's not that you do diagnostic vitrectomy, 27 gauge, it's like a routine. This one is different. Yes, Prithvi's put silicon oil. And what would be the rate of detachment from the uh, Detachment is not that much because now we make sure hyaloid is removed and everything is done. So detachment is not really a big concern. To me, the big concern is still the diagnostic part, the backup, you know. The initial photograph was actually three months ago. The patient delayed it for three months. So Vitreous haze, uh, haze was there, but under the microscope, you were seeing it more clinically. It was not that apparent. So with the illumination and all, it suddenly became the vitreous was hazy. Yes. Thank you, Watson. <laughs>
So now, now I'll move on to the next talk by Dr. Sangeet Mittal, and he'll going to tell us about sampling in a case of endophthalmitis. Dr. Sangeet, Sangeet is well known for his surgical videos, and he is a very senior vitroretina consultant at Thindai Hospital, Jalandhar. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Manisha for including me in this uh, IC. So what I'm going to show is uh, fluid sampling techniques in endophthalmitis and some uh, do-it-yourself hacks which uh, can make this sampling easier and less complicated. So why do we need to... Uh, uh, this, this, sorry, the endophthalmitis can be post-operative, post-traumatic, or endogenous, and it may uh, be due to bacteria, fun viruses, fungi, acanthamoeba, or even due to biofilms. And why is this important is because uh, even with, uh, if, if you say that, okay, why is it important? Ultimately, we are going to give uh, the injection of vancomycin and ceftazidime in all these cases. So it is important because uh, five, almost 5% 5 cases have vancomycin resistance, and even primary uh, surgery is indicated when intravitreal injections fail. But again, recurrences are very common, and visual outcome is uh, poor in many cases. The sampling material that we often use is the aqueous tap, the vitreous tap, the vitreous biopsy, and the vitrectomy fluid. I don't know, I, I need not go into the sampling details because the previous speakers have already covered these things. So uh, I'll just go over the techniques of how to take these samples. Uh, so this is the first one, that is the Aquas tab. So this is a video courtesy Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital. And uh, generally, we mount a 26 gauge needle over a 1 cc tuberculin syringe. And then we withdraw the plunger and collect the sample into this uh, syringe. But again, uh, this uh, many, of, many a times, this gives us a um, the, the, the report comes as quantity is not sufficient and uh, because many a times we are not able to get a very good sample with this technique. So a small uh, modification that uh, we can do is that I, I just uh, uh, cut two cc syringes attached to a rubber suction bulb and uh, this is then the 26 k needle is mounted on the syringe and there is a small hole in the bulb which acts as a safety valve. <laughs> So vacuum is created by pressing the bulb after covering the hole. And when you release the vacuum, the fluid can be aspirated when the pressure, bulb, pressure over this bulb is lifted. You see the fluid collection here. And this is the live over the eye. The 26 gauge needle is inserted in the anterior chamber after creating the vacuum. Then pressure is released slowly as aqueous fluid uh, collects in the syringe. So this way, uh, we can get uh, some addict, some uh, more amount of fluid sample as we are able to withdraw in a syringe using the tuberculin syringe and, the, uh, and manually uh, uh, pulling the plunger out. The, oh, sorry. So this is a, a technique of the vitreous tap. Now, most of the times, I don't uh, advocate this uh, technique because it leads to a lot of traction on the vitreous fibers. Uh, leading to more complications. This is a video again, courtesy of the Arvindai Hospital, and how they do the vitreous tap. Uh, three to 3.5 millimeters from the limbus. They take a 24 gauge needle, and they insert the needle into the vitreous cavity with the needle pointing towards the center of the globe, and then they withdraw the plunger again to collect this fluid sample. Again, but again, as I told you, it can lead to much traction over the vitreous fibrils and can lead to post-op, even sometimes post-op retinal detachment also in these cases because already in endophthalmitis cases, the retina is very necrotic. So uh, again, a small modification. If you're not planning to do a vitrectomy, a primary vitrectomy in, uh, in these cases, you can, what you can do is you can take a vitreous tap or a vitreous biopsy using the vitrectomy cutter. Uh, Dr. Manisha had shown one using the syringe. So in this, what we do is we attach a, a three-way stopcock and we keep the third port closed. Then even in the topical anesthesia, we insert this 27-gauge trocar, a 3 to 3.5 millimeter from the limbus, and then cut and aspirate the vitreous till you get the hypotony or when the cornea starts dipping inside. Uh, 
So that is the end point when you can stop. And uh, the fluid uh, in this case collects into the tubing. Uh, you see it's getting collected into the suction tubing. And now to con contract the uh, hypotony, we give the intravitreal injections to the same sclerotomy port that we have created. And once this is done, now you attach the 1cc syringe to this third port that was there and you can collect the fluid which is in the tubing into the syringe and uh, then you can send seal this with a sterile again cap and then you can send this for uh, sampling uh, or you can inoculate directly on the uh, plates. So the, this is the last video I'm going to show. In Indian settings, many times what we use is we use the same cassette and the same bag uh, for doing vitrectomy and generally we keep the end of thalmitis cases as the last uh, because uh, it could spread infection. And if we send the same bag uh, for the sampling, uh, it may give a lot of errors. So what uh, we can do is, uh, this, this is a pre-sterilized, uh, this is a pre-used but sterilized autoclaved uh, ringer lactate bottles. And you can attach an IV set to it. You remove the bag and you can, at the other end of the IV set is connected to the cassette. And you can see the vitrectomy fluid, uh, when you do a vitrectomy, collects into this bottle. And again, you can send this bottle for this fluid, again, for uh, sampling. So these are uh, some of the hacks that you can use, use yourself uh, in your OT to make these things a little easier. The investigations that generally we need is the gram stain, the KOH, the bacterial culture sensitivity, or the fungal culture sensitivity. And uh, we have seen earlier also there are reports that the vitreous fluid and the vitrectomy fluid is more sensitive and more culture positive as compared to the aqueous fluid. So those samples are much more important than the aqueous fluid itself. And uh, it's important to get them. So in the end, uh, just I would like to, uh, the take home message is that the vitreous fluid is the best sample for culture in clinically diagnosed endophthalmitis and gram stain and QH are also beneficial investigations which provide results within no time. Thank you. So Dr. Sangeet, I just wanted to ask you one thing that um, many a times when we have the patient in our clinics presenting with endov, would you recommend collecting an AC-TAP sample before you load the patients with antibiotics or you prefer taking up the patient straight for a, a vitreous, vitreous sample? It depends on how fast you can go uh, get your OT ready. If you can get your OT ready in no time, I think you can directly go ahead with the taking the vitreous sample. But if it, if you if you have uh, seen the patient now and your OT is getting to get ready in the evening or in the next day morning, I think it's better to uh, take a quiz tap and give an intravitreal injection at that time, and then later on maybe you can. So now we will be, yeah, Dr. Vatsala. I would have a little different take on the situation, especially most of end of termite is the patient is already in the planning. So you take him to OT, the planning would increase at least rather than, that I would say that take AC tap and give intravitreal antibiotics there and then see the response in an hour. The patient is better than your patient is at play. So yeah, I, I. I agree, uh, there are different situations, different patients, uh, and different management in many of these cases. Uh, I do agree uh, that patient is panicky. And most of the times we don't have our OT ready at that very moment when the patient comes to you. So it's very difficult actually in clinical practice to take a vitreous tap then and there uh, at, at that very moment. So uh, I agree that we should not delay the management of the patient. Uh, we should give an intravitreal injection earlier if you feel that uh, the, OT, the patient can't be taken to the OT for whatever reasons it could be. 
So our next talk is going to be by Dr. Mahesh P. Shanmugam, who is head of Vitoretna Services and Ocular Oncology, Shankaraya Hospital, Bangalore. Apparently, sir was not able to make it to AIOS, and that's why he sent in a pre-recorded talk. And his topic is needling the tumors for a diagnosis. Good afternoon. I thank Dr. Manisha Garwa and the AIOS for the opportunity to be part of this session. In this talk, let us look at high needle aspiration biopsy and existing biopsy techniques when faced with intractable tumors. The proliferative biopsy technique I will not be covering, as the other authors will be covering it as part of their talk in this section of course. Here is a classic example of when a fine needle aspiration biopsy may be required in managing an intractable tumor. This elderly gentleman presented with a coronal mass and a secondary retinal attachment. The coronal mass appeared to be of metastatic origin, and despite an extensive systemic investigation, the primary could not be uncovered. To find out where the mass is arising from, where the primary is arising from, a fine needle aspiration biopsy may be acquired in this patient. In this slide, we can see the three different routes one can take to perform a fine needle aspiration biopsy. The most commonly utilized is the transvitreal fine needle aspiration biopsy, wherein the needle enters the pass plana 180 degrees away from the mass lesion and enters the mass through the retina, creating a small hydrogenic break. The transcleral fine needle aspiration biopsy avoids this retinal break by entering the mass through the overlying sclera. The risk in this is there is a possibility of spillage of cells in the orbit when we enter the mass through the overlying sclera. If there is substantial exudative retinal detachment, we can do a subretinal fine needle aspiration biopsy. Whereas the needle enters away from the mass lesion into the subretinal space beneath the exudative retinal detachment and enters the mass lesion. Here we see the equipment which is used to perform the fine needle aspiration biopsy. Usually a 24 gauge needle or a 26 gauge needle is used and this is connected to a small piece of silicon tubing and on the other end we have a 5cc or a 10cc syringe connected to it. Here we see the technique of fine needle aspiration biopsy along with the vitrectomy. So you can see the exudative retinal detachment and the PVD was induced. And you can see that the needle is going through the retina into the subretinal space and a small bit of the tissue from the mass is taken out for biopsy. And the fluid air exchange is performed and laser photopyrogenic is this performed around the hydrogenic vitrectomy. So not all the time we do uh, vitrectomy to achieve fine needle aspiration biopsy, FNAB can be done using the indirect ophthalmoscope transferably without doing a vitrectomy. So now we utilize the techniques of vitrectomy which give a little bit more control. So we use a light pipe or a Chandler light pipe and a vitrectomy need not be done in all the cases and transcutial biopsy can also be performed. Once the needle tip is inside the mass lesion, the assistant exerts suction onto the syringe and no mass, considering that the mass is a solid lesion, no tissue or no fluid can be seen traversing the tubing. So the syringe is sucked out and kept that the suction is retained for about a minute and then the, the plunger is released slowly. Whatever little sliver of tissue is there in the needle is the one which is, which is obtained for a biopsy. Once the needle is removed from the eye, the needle is kept into a bowl of uh, BSS and the BSS is aspirated through the needle and through the tubing into the syringe. So the little sliver of tissue which is there in the tip of the needle is the one which gets washed into the syringe and that is the, that is the tissue which is utilized for histopathology. Finally, last question biopsy is seldom performed in retinoblastoma and in the rare situation if one has to perform a finally last question biopsy, the recommended technique is to go through the periphery, peripheral cornea, through the root of the iris, through the venues and into the mass lesion. This gives rise to multiple interfaces which can wipe off the cells which may be sticking on to the to, uh, which may be sticking on to the needle, thereby decreasing the risk of an extracular spread post FNAB, as retinoblastoma is a very friable tumor. FNAB in suspected malignant lesions may be performed when there is a need for tissue diagnosis to confirm the diagnosis of a primary intractable tumor or to identify the tissue of origin in a secondary involving the eye. But more commonly, FNAB is presently performed to obtain tissue from the tumor for genetic analysis, particularly EVL melanoma. EVL melanoma genetic makeup is associated with prognosis for life 
and so it's a good idea to obtain tissue from the melanoma for genetic analysis. And hence in the melanoma, FNAB is performed to obtain tumor tissue prior to brachytherapy. So here we see a black mass lesion overlaying the disc which continued to grow on serial color. Though it looked like a melanocytoma, we were concerned about the growth of the lesion. So here the patient underwent a vitrectomy and a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Not exactly fine needle aspiration biopsy, but this is a kind of an incisional biopsy because the lesion is too small for the needle to go inside and obtain a small obtain a tissue sample. And the lesion is right over the optic nerve as well. So the ILM or the membrane overlying the mass is disrupted and a small piece of the tissue is picked up using the forceps and this was then histopathologically proven, proven to be a melanocytoma and not a melanoma so we continue following up this way. In contrast to a fine needle aspiration biopsy or incisional biopsy along with vitreotin techniques, sometimes we may have to do an incisional biopsy transclerally. Here we see a mass lesion arising from the ciliary body in a young gentleman and this lesion continues to grow. You can see a trap curve being created a partial thickness clearance flap is created and the inner lamella of the sclera is diathermized and removed along with a small piece of the tissue. You can see the jet black color of the lesion indicating that it's possibly a melanocytoma and the trap door is closed. So this is an incisional biopsy and the histopathology did confirm that it was diffuse melanocytoma of the ciliary body. We treated the patient with brachytherapy and post brachytherapy you can see the mass lesion as regressed, allowing this young gentleman to retain the eye. Sometimes you may have to perform an excisional biopsy if the lesion is accessible for excision and if the eye will survive post excision as well. So usually the excisional biopsy is done under general anesthesia and hypotensive anesthesia because of the risk of a catastrophic suprachoral hemorrhage can happen with an eye which is open and if the blood pressure tends to go up. So this excision biopsy is performed in eyes with visual potential in an attempt to save the eye and preferably benign lesions clinically or prior HP using a fine needle aspiration biopsy or an excision biopsy. If malignant lesion is to be removed using an excision biopsy, at least 3 mm clearance of normal tissue should be removed along with the mass lesion. Here we see an example of a young gentleman with a growing suprachoroidal tumor. The lesion was in the suprachoroidal space and we did a biopsy and it showed that the patient had a very, very rare schwannoma arising from the suprachoroidal space. And considering that this is a benign lesion, we decided to go ahead with removal of the mass lesion itself. So a clear factor is uh, performed. And this is where the incision biopsy was, uh, was performed earlier and very careful exposure of the tumor, which is the suprachoroidal space is done. And so what we see here is the choroid, and this is the mass lesion arising from the suprachoroidal area. And very careful dissection without opening up the choroid, without making perforation of the choroid is done. We use the endocrine probe to hold on to the tumor and excise it. Subsequently, the sclera was closed and the biopsy site opened up, which was also closed subsequently. And postoperatively, you can see the, there's no mass lesion and the young gentleman continues to retain his eye with six lesion. So, anterior tumors, this is a malignant lesion, melanoma, are in the ciliary body. So, this is how we go about doing an excision biopsy. Considering that uh, part of the lesion, once it is removed along with the ciliary body, the, cap the zonular support will not be there. We inserted an uh, endocapsular ring after doing the fecal insertion. A sterile factor is created. So, three millimeters of the normal iris around the mass, around the ciliary body melanoma, which is growing to the root of the iris, is done. Here, instead of doing a sector electrum, we did so to a peripheral electrum. And a diathermy is performed. The anterior chamber is entered. And the whole chunk of tissue, the part of the iris around the tumor, the ciliary body and the overlying sclera is carefully resected and an open sky vitrectomy is performed and the sclera is closed. So 3 millimeters of normal tissue should be removed along with the tumor as well. So this is a other gentleman who had a full thickness involvement of the sclera with a very, very small melanoma which has grown through the sclera. 
and he underwent the full thickness I on the section wherein the overlying panning teva, the overlying clear and the mass was removed as the tumor very very small and the ciliary body continued to function and we used a sterile patch graft in this patient to close the Gentleman has been followed up for the last 15 years without risk of metastatic disease and he continues to enjoy for six condition. So this is the post operative appearance about five to six years later. The ultimate excision biopsy is a nucleation. Whenever we are unable to come to a diagnosis and the eye doesn't have visual potential, there is no point in going inside and trying to risk a tumor spread into the orbit. So if there is no visual potential and the other eye is normal and there is a need for diagnosis, we can go ahead and do an enucleation of the sightless eye. So to summarize, spine needle aspiration biopsy is performed in select situation when there is a need for tissue diagnosis or when there is a need for obtaining tissue for genetic analysis. An incisional biopsy is performed in anterior deep place lesions through the transclusal route. An excisional biopsy is performed in preferably benign lesions involving the anterior part of the anterior tumors when the ciliary body are thoroid. And in malignant lesions, we need to have a 3 millimeter clearance around the mass lesion as well. And the biopsies are safe and safe with appropriate technique and prompt treatment. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So thank you, Dr. Mahesh. I think he has beautifully covered the topic. Uh, I think we've all collected a lot of, you know, techniques and tips to collect the various samples. But all these samples are going to be a waste if our lab colleagues don't make some sense out of it. So now, but last but not the least talk of this particular session, I invite Dr. Jyotirme Biswasa, and he's heading the uh, uveitis and ocular pathology uh, department of Shankar Netrale, Chennai. And uh, sir would be telling us the various tips, how to handle and, uh, you know, make the samples reach him. So we have got a uh, lot of talks on the techniques and collecting the samples from the lead conjunctiva orbit, uh, lead conjunctiva, and then uh, iris tissues, as well as that uh, vitreous and fine needle aspiration biopsy and collateral biopsy, as well as the removal of the eye. I'll be talking about that, how we de handle these specimens. So particularly in uveitis, Etiology of the uveitis, as I don't want to describe in details, it could be non-infectious, infectious, and masquerade. And infectious can be viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic. And uh, viral would be virisologista virus, herpes simplex virus, cytomegalovirus, measles, and uh, influenza. Bacterial, uh, syphilis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, fungal, Candida, coccidomycosis, and parasitic toxoplasma, toxocara. Pathologic study, various techniques which has been described, the antechamber aspirate, iris biopsy, vitreous biopsy, and then retinochoral biopsy. Uh, we get the biopsy pathology, the techniques, the various specimens, like, you know, is this the case of pseudohypopian? We get a large basic, basically cohesive cells, suggestive of retinoblastoma. And this is a case of a uh, lens industry uveitis where you could see the large macrophage laden, um, macrophages laden with the lymph, um, uh, lens material. And this is the final aspiration biopsy of a large cell lymphoma, uh, or this is a primary vitreoretinal lymphoma where you could see that uh, the necrotic background large lymphoma cells are seen. So when you get a intraocular fluid, uh, that specimen should be go for a direct smear. Cytospin is the better, and then culture, PCR, and then immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry. I'll be talking a little bit about it. 
Cytospin, we use that machine 1000 RPM for five minutes revolutions um, for concentrating the specimens. And what you get, a concentrated smears. And this is a case of metastatic tumors from the uh, anterior chamber aspirate. And we could see that the large uh, cells with hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm. So you get a very concentrated smears, and it is easy for to make a diagnosis. So how about the culture? Culture is the gold standard, but less sensitive, takes too much time, not practical for virus infection. This is a primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, a diagnostic challenge in the tissue diagnosis, and um, is mandatory. And uh, here we see that uh, cells are often necrotic and friable. Cytological examinations within an hour is uh, uh, required. There is a several fixation technique is there. There is a hope fixation technique, a promising alternative for common prosthetic back, uh, cancer biobanking approaches and which can be used in the intraocular lesions also. And then um, cell block, which you do over there, uh, where the tissues are, um, the fluid samples is put in the tube and then put in a filter paper and uh, the method is preparing cytopologic material, which can be processed, sectioned, stained, and viewed on histologic sections. Easier to do special stain, immunohistochemistry on the cell block slides, requires minimal effort and extremely cost effective. And this is a cell block preparation from the vitreous aspect of a patient with primary intraocular lymphoma. And you can see that the, a lot of tissues are there and with the, with the pleomorphic cells, lymphoma cells are seen in necrotic background. What is the advantage of this one that we have uh, uh, found that is a high diagnostic sensitivity and low pseudopositivity rate, cell block method. And the score vitrectomy leads to the poor cell uh, recovery. Personal vitrectomy is better, as is mentioned over there. Primary intraocular lymphoma, alcohol fixation causes poor cell recovery. Expert cytopathologist is needed. A biopsy technique and yielding is that one large round or oval nuclei segmented with the <coughs> prominent nuclei with scanty basophilic cytoplasm, as we see over here. This is a cytology on MCG stains, or you can do that HNE uh, &E stains, cell block preparation, and we use that marker for the T and B cell marker. CD20 B cell marker was positive in this case, uh, primary vit retinal lymphoma. Molecular biology is another aspect which is uh, I wanted to highlight about it, particularly in the viruses, which you cannot do that uh, smear or culture, and it can it has improved the um, various uh, diagnostic techniques, diagnosis of that one. So it's a kind of a xeroxing or multiplying the DNA segment, and is a, in a million times it de uh, magnifies as. Is the reaction sample a primer for the specific de detections, nucleotides and enzymes is put into that one. You can take sample from the anterior chamber, uh, corneal surface, conjunctiva, uh, subretinal fluid and the vitreous material, and various organisms which can be detected um, from the PCR technique. This is a PCR machine, and this is a gel documentation system. And here is the beauty is that there is a Positive control and the inbuilt negative control is there. And various infectious agents uh, can now be uh, detected by the PCR, starting from the bacteria, fungus, um, microbacteria, even syphilis can be detected with the PCR techniques. Single step PCR, nested PCR, multiplex PCR, quantitative PCR, and now its next generation sequencing has come. Single step PCR is a one target, one step reactions, 20 to 40 cycles, used extensively to detect CMB, HSB, HJB, toxoplasma, gondai. Nested PCR, we use the two set of primers in two successive PCR detection. In the first PCR, one pair of primers is used to generate amplified DNA product. This will then form the target for the second PCR reaction. Advantage is increased specificity and increased sensitivity. This disadvantage is the risk of contaminations and applications used extensively to detect microbacterium tuberculosis gene.
Example of nested PCR, this is a patient of dimness of vision of um, both eyes, and it treated the spiroid and intravitreal transfusion asynchronous injection, and one eye has got vitreous says, another eye has got exudates. The eye, which has got dense vitreous says, we did a vitrectomy, and we could see that diagnostic vitrectomy was done, and we could see that um, large granuloma seen from the vitreous cavity with lymphocytes and epithelioid cells. And the PCR came positive for Mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. Multiplex PCR can be used as a single PCR dissection to detect multiple pathogens using multiple primer sets, each targeting particular pathogens. Each primer set generates amplification of specific size different from each other. Advantage is simultaneous, simultaneous detection of multiple pathogens but it decreases the sensitivity due to the primer competition compared to the uniplex. Conventionally, real-time PCR and um, reverse transcript PCR is um, preceded by addition of a convert RNA to DNA, and then it goes to amplifications of the same. Quantitative PCR or real-time PCR can be um, done where you, use the, you get the copy number, this is a case of a viral encephalitis followed by the acute retinal necrosis. And we did the agarose gel electrophotogram, which nested PCR was positive by a herpes simplex um, uh, type 2 and type 1. And quantitative PCR showed 7,68,874 copies of the um, DNA. Across human polymerase chain reactions in UVH is the utility and the safety. And uh, this has been and demonstrated by our study, and polymerase chain reaction in the various samples and the viral retinitis is of utmost importance. What's new is that uh, impact of polymerase chain reactions in finding uh, new organisms, metagenomic diff sequencing for the diagnosis of intraocular infections much more precisely, and identification of new pathogens in intraocular fluid in patients with UVITs. So, PCR in uveitis is a key laboratory test in the diagnosis of uveitis, prompt, sensitive, and specific molecular diagnosis of pathogenic microorganisms. Metagenomic sequencing will not only aid in diagnosis, but also help to establish new etiologies and clinical entities. So sending the specimen for PCR one is ACTAP and V-test can be transferred in the syringe used for the collection. The movement should be arrested by sealing the sample with abro tape or adhesive tape. Specimen can also be transferred to the sterile 1.5 ml vial vials and transmitted without any preservative and freezing using the ice pack. Last but not the least is that we are doing an MYD 88L265 mutations, which is useful in the vitretinal lymphoma. And, uh, we can detect the, organ, the uh, uh, spike in the DNA gene sequencing. And uh, last, I conclude that as you are pathology, so is our practice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Biswas. And I just want to thank all my co-instructors for this interesting session. And we've had some wonderful talks by Dr. Vishali Gupta on chorioretinal biopsy. I and Dr. Sangeet, we covered vitreous sampling. And we had Dr. Somshila covering the corneal sampling. And last but not the least, Dr. Biswas telling us the various techniques in the labs. So thank you once again for joining us for this instruction course. <laughs>